everyone and welcome to Women in the Word and thank you for joining me today. All of you, I can see all your beautiful faces, so good to see you here. What a great start we had last week with Michelle on Berechay in the beginning. My takeaway was how God really thought about how to fashion us women and put his character traits in us. I really loved that, that section last week. So it's important for us women today to adorn ourselves, not just with our beautiful hairstyles and our gold and, uh, you know, our expensive clothing, but definitely with some good works and some good deeds so that people can see who we are as women of God. That's how we worship the Lord, as, as one of the reasons how we worship the Lord. So it's good that you are here today. Um, and don't forget that you can join Pastor Greg on the, the uh, Torah portion on Saturday mornings at 9.30 till 11 a.m. in the Zoom room live. As always, you are welcome to unmute yourself. And I'm just trying to get my little thingy bobby here. Okay, we're getting there now. You're welcome to unmute yourself. And it's a perfect time to jump on board because we are in week two. And we are in Noah or Noah. And today we are going to learn about Rahab. And I suppose you're wondering, how is Rahab similar to Noah? Well, we're going to learn about that today. So first of all, I'll get one of you to pray. Glennis, would you be able to pray us in today? Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, um, that we can come around the word today, Lord. I just bless Teresa, Lord, and everyone on this today and who will listen to it later, Lord. Open our ears, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord, to what you are saying to us all. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 And thank you, Glennis. So how is Rahab similar to Noah? Did you know that in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, they are both commended for their faith. So I'm going to go to Hebrews 11.1, 1, and it says, now faith, actually, before I do that, what is faith? Can someone tell me what is faith? Fully believing that God exists. Yes. And a trust in God. Yes. Yes, exactly. So in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I found another translation of faith, and it says, in God's word translation, it says, Faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. And in the verse 2 of that, it says, God accepted our ancestors because of their faith. So I really like that application of that scripture. So let's look at Hebrews 11, where Noah and Rahab are mentioned. In Hebrews 11, 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. In Hebrews 11.30, it says, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So Rahab and Noah both lived in a crooked and wicked environment and yet believed God and took action to show their belief in God. So how did God see Noah and what merited his salvation? So if we can go to the book of Genesis first and, re and read um, Genesis 6 to number 9. Beth, could you read that as this is the, uh, yeah, Genesis 6, verse 9. Yes, Teresa. Thank you. I will. Genesis 6, 9. This is to the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. 
and he, he oh. yeah no he did and I found um in the AMP version as well that Noah was a righteous and blameless man in his evil generation and Noah walked in habitual fellowship with God so it's not saying scripture is not saying that Noah was a perfect man but he was a blameless man and he walked in fellowship with God and he listened to God so does, can anyone tell me what their understanding of blameless means or righteousness? Anyone want to guess at it? Uh, someone who. Yes, oh, yes, Glennis. Oh, so, someone who walks in the laws, um, the statutes of God. Yes, that's true. And so what about Noah, though? How, um, how, do you, how was he seen blameless? Yes, Beth. Well, the um, the laws hadn't actually been given then, then, or the Torah, but it was almost like it was written on his heart, just as it's going to be in the um, the king, the millennium or the kingdom to come. Rather, uh, the laws will be written on our hearts. But um, he he was the most righteous man out of everyone else living at the time. That's exactly right. He certainly was. So he was walking with God righteously in a wicked generation. So and he was obeying God. So he was basically aligning with God at that time. So yep. um if because you've read Genesis 9, could you read um 6 5 as well, verse 5? Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his, his heart was only evil continually. Wow. So the world is wicked. Noah lived in this crooked and perverse generation and he remained upright. So it's a choice, isn't it, to remain upright, to remain blameless and separated himself from the sin and darkness of man at that time. So he was in fellowship with God, aligning with God, and he stood out to God. So Noah merited God's grace because of his righteousness in a wicked world. So God was judging the world. Time was up for the uprighteous and the wicked. God informed Noah of his plans to eradicate mankind due to their evil ways and instructed him to build an ark. Noah built the ark in faith over 120 years to the instructions God gave him. Unfortunately, no one repented or changed in that whole time. And they would perish in the flood, in the mabul, as in M-A-B-B-U-L. That's the Hebrew word. And it means deluge. Like it wasn't just a flood. It was deluge. It was coming from the sky and up from the ground. So that's what the Hebrew word is for deluge, mabul. Mabul. So this we're at the flood, and this happened in 1656 after creation. If you want the BC date, it's 2105. So Noah, a righteous man, put his life and his family's life in God's hands. His trust is in God alone. He trusts that only God could save him. I see the exceptional faith that he had in God. This man led his family ultimately saving mankind and the animals from extinction by trusting God and putting his faith into action by his works. What works are we talking about here? The way he conducted his life. Um, you know, where um, I was reading this morning, it was saying um, about blameless, that that... Um, they relate that a bit to, you know, the um, the sacrifices that um, they're unblemished. Yes. And so that's the same sort of word. Blameless can also be like um, wholeness. So Noah conducted himself in that way in that he was like a whole man. Um, yes. And so, yeah, nothing was missing from all things that he did, all his character and the way he, um, like his moral character, because um, the opposite of that, like the wickedness, 
is that immorality, you know, and the propensity to do evil deeds. But he was, yeah, the opposite of that. And um, so on all counts, you know, he was, um, yeah, upright before God. Well, thank you, Carol. That was really good. So we've really got a good picture of this man, Noah, haven't we? He really, yes, Beth. I just thought of something to add to what you said, Carol. He also knew the difference between kosher and non-kosher animals, which was, um, you know, just an amazing thing. It had to be his relationship with God for him to know that because uh, when he selected, oh, look, he might be going to say that, Teresa. <laughs> no, no, uh, we, we're not going to go into the animals as such today. So continue on, Beth. That's a good point of what you're saying. Well, I was going to say the animals that he selected had to be all kosher animals. So they weren't... I, um, I think there was an exception. I think the raven was an exception, but I'm not 100% on that. Well, how but come it just pigs? shows how yeah. righteous he was. How come pigs and that are around today? Well, that's a question, Glennis. I'm going <laughs> to let you investigate that. I would love you to share that with me. It actually is a very good question, but you'll have to share it with me when you find the information. Oh, just to add to that, last year Michelle did uh, Noah, um, Neymar, which is Noah's wife, and she touched on the three uh, wives as well. And she, and I did ask the question because you can see how far you've come in 12 months when you go back and watch your videos from last year. And I asked that question, how did Noah know um, righteousness and how did he know kosher animals as such mm. and the answer was that because it had come down through Seth which was the gifted child to Adam and Eve and um and had come down that line to Methuselah and things like that because remember Methuselah died um about seven days prior to the them the, the rain and so yeah. for whatever reason God allowed a seven day period of grace there but that's where the actual righteousness has come down from, to, from that family line as well. And so if you go back into last year and, and watch that one that Michelle did, she has a lot of facts and information there mm -hmm. on the ark itself. On It was actually very good. And she finished up with um, the XX chromosome that can be led back to the three wives of Noah and, um, and that gets carried through with women today. It's such a good teach uh, that Michelle did. So if you have time, go back and watch last year's video. But right uh, now we're going to head off into... Sorry, can I just... just yes. Finish on with this. Just um, also with regards to Noah, um, to remember who his great-grandfather um, was, which was Enoch. Yes. So, I mean, you know, he might have spent quite a bit of time around him, you know, and so that... You know, that sort of genetic makeup, but also probably the way Enoch was. Yes. Um, he, you know, met, um, just by being around. Mm. Exactly. So, 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 yeah, so the righteousness has come down that line. Mm. Um, good point, Michelle. Oh, it's Carol. <laughs> 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 Michelle's got the good points from last year, but good point today, Carol. <laughs> All right, so now we're going into the book of Joshua. So we've, we've got a good background. We know who Noah is as a man. Now we're going into the book, Chapter 2 on Joshua, and we're going to pick up on Rahab. So the timeline that we're looking at right now is 2,488 AC, which is after creation. And What was that, 2,488? Does anyone remember what else happened in that year? Come on, you Torah scholars, you would remember. All right, I'll tell you. Moses died. Oh. <laughs> so Moses died. I know it's a lot to remember we're picking up <laughs> on, but Moses died in that year. This is what we learn on the Torah portion each Saturday morning. It is a fantastic way to learn the Bible. And when I first started, I couldn't remember anything. So I know we're getting better each year. 
So Moses died this year, that year, and it's 830 years after the flood. So the Israelites are on the other side of the Jordan River, opposite Jericho. Chapter 1, God said to Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God is giving Israel, God is giving Israel the promised land. So we're at that point now. It's so exciting. I love this story. Okay, so June. Hello, June. Would you mind reading, June, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1? Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Thank you, June. Now, because this story is quite big, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share about the place, the Jericho. Then I'm going to share about the key people in that, in that scripture of Joshua, which are the spies. And then lastly, we're going to share about Rahab. So as we're going through today, just remember we're going to get to Rahab, but we're not going to do the whole hog right now. We're going to do the background first. Are we so, going to sing the song at the end? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll get sing you along, that, you know. <laughs> so now whose Bible has Acacia Grove and whose has Shittim? Mine's got, got Shittim. Shittim. All right. Well, my Bible has Acacia Grove. And so I just want to let you know. That's here in Brisbane, isn't it? Acacia Ridge. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Wrong one. <laughs> You're funny today, Carol. Now, Acacia <laughs> Grove uh, or Shittim is actually means Acacia. So it is Acacia Grove or Shittim. That's what Shittim mm. means, Acacia. And it is a place east of Jordan. Okay, so now let's give some Jericho facts. I love this city. You know, we've learned a lot about Shechem in our Torah portion studies. Now, as I was looking at Jericho, there's a lot that happened here. So Jericho, we'll get some pictures later too. Jericho is described in the Bible as the city of palm trees located in the Jordan Valley with the Jordan River to the east and Jerusalem to the west. Besides being old, Jericho is one of the lowest cities in the world, about 800 feet, 244 metres up below sea level. Wow. I know. And Jericho is the first city captured by Joshua. That's where we are right, right now after the 40 years of sojourning in the desert. Can anyone remember anything else that happened in Jericho? The walls came tumbling down. Oh, that's exactly <laughs> right. And we're going to learn about that in two minutes. But Jesus and the disciples leaving Jericho, the two blind men received sight. And you can read about that in Matthew 20 to 29, verse 29. Another thing is, remember the sycamore tree? Who climbed the sycamore tree? Zacchaeus. That's exactly right. And who was he, Glennis? Do you remember what his profession was? Um, no, I'm not. Oh, was he a tax collector? Tax, yeah, yes. tax collector. That's right. And he repented. Therefore, he had salvation. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And guess what else happened along the Jericho? It's, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus is passing mm -hmm. through Jericho and, and shares the story and then he says, he shares a story about the Good Samaritan. And then he says, which of these do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. So we're looking at God and how merciful he is, especially when it comes to the application of Rahab, you know, and how merciful he is to Gentiles and to sinners. And, you know, and that's what, you know, faith and mercy, this is what this is all about today. Also, not far from Jericho uh, is a mountain range, and it's about 8.4 kilometres. 
of Jericho. And so they also say that this is where Jesus went for the 40-day fast and then went to the top of the mountain. So we'll have a look at those mountains soon. There's a lot of other great things that happened in Jericho, but another one was um, it served as a provincial outpost for Eglon, the king of Moab, um, who held Israel under tribute for 18 years, and I talked about that in uh, Deborah when we did Deborah in the Women in the Word. There's a, a spring in Jericho. Elisha was staying in Jericho. The people of the city said to Elisha, look, our Lord, this town is well situated, as you can see but the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Bring me a new bowl, he said, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went into the spring and threw the salt in it, saying, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. And the water has remained pure to this day, according to the word Elisha had spoken. So if any of you have been there, there is an actual Elisha spring. I haven't got a picture of that for you today. I should have, sorry. But there I'll is be there that. next week. Oh, great. I'll be there next week. <laughs> Bring us a picture back then. Yep. <laughs> so there's a lot. And just um, the new, you know, Jericho has been built a couple of times actually after the, the, the first time. And, and King Herod built the second Jericho. And it says um, this from the sources that a Roman emperor, Augustus, granted the estate to Cleopatra, a queen of Egypt, but King Herod desired it too, and so he leased it back from Cleopatra. Herod also built a lavish royal complex in Jericho. He also constructed in Jericho a unique entertainment complex of a theatre combined with a stadium and a hippodrome. Now, a hippodrome is, I had to look that up, it's where they do, you know, chariot races, horse races and all those sorts of things as well. So that came after this fall of Jericho and then a, a new Jericho was built, the city was built. Um, yeah, so the, just some information there. And ironically, Jericho, along with the Gaza Strip, was the first territory given to the Palestinians by Israel as part of the Oslo Peace Agreement in 1994 before the outbreak of the Palestinian War in 2000. So. You know, if you go and do a search on Jericho, there is that much. This this city is a really important city when it comes to us Torah scholars to know information about it and to know some of the things that have happened there. There is so much more that I just couldn't get them all down today. If so you go on gonna... to sorry, if you go on to YouTube onto Expedition Bible, it shows you all that being arche archaeologically, you know, being yeah. excavated and that. Yes, Fantastic. and I do have some pictures of those today, Glennis, so we'll get to that. Mm. Let's talk about Joshua. Who knows about Joshua? Who is he? Um, the son of Nun. He exactly, was... yes. That's who he is. Just as simple as like that is enough. And so he was Moses' successor to lead the children of Israel to the promised land, and he was given full authority of leadership. Joshua was also one of the 12 spies dispatched by Moses to scout the promised land. And he was one of the two spies who brought a positive and encouraging report of the promised land. Does anyone know who the other spy was with Joshua? Caleb. Caleb. Exactly. And where does he come from? Does anyone know his tribe? Who, Caleb or Joshua? Caleb. from the tribe of Judah, and the Caleb was the son of Jephuna, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. Was one of them related to Moses or not? If I he, got it wrong. He is actually um, not Caleb, I don't think. Hang no, on. I thought it was Joshua. I don't yes. know. No. So Caleb um, was given the land of Hebron by Joshua as an inheritance as well he was the only one that gave a good report with Joshua and now Joshua in Joshua 2 we have Joshua sending out two men to spy the land so two men are going out now right at this point now who knows who these two men are that are going out in to spy the land I know one, one was no, called Salmon I don't know who the other one, what name I was. Thought, I thought one was Caleb too, another. 
Yes, I don't know. exactly. So Caleb is going back out again, or Caleb, mm. and Phineas. Phineas. Now, we've heard all Pincus. We've learned Pincus. on the Torah portion right. about Pincus, and he... Pincus has a really good story about him. He's like a trailblazer, and he ended up becoming, um, being anointed in the as in the priesthood. Do you know why? Do you know? Remember what he did? I love this story. Do you remember Balaam um, talked about how to get the Israelites to sin, and so with the Moab and the Midianite women, and then someone brazenly decided to go and have relations with someone in a tent. So there's an Israelite that brazenly goes and has relations with a Midianite woman in the tent. That Israelite's name is, um, what's his name? Zimri. And he's the son of Zulu, Salu. Sorry, not Zulu, Salu. <laughs> and then the woman that he had relations with in the tent was Cosby. And she's actually um, the daughter of, uh, who is she the daughter of? Not sure who she's the daughter of, but anyway. So that's that story with Phineas. So he he um he's also known as Phineas the Zealot or Pincus. So there's a lot of people in this story. So we're talking about Caleb and um, Phineas or Pincus now that are the two spies that are going in to spy on Jericho. He must have been pretty important for for um, part of the Torah to be named after him. Yes extremely because he is a bit of a trial he has a great story and you can go and read about that in numbers 25 go to numbers 25 10 to 1 and you can read about his whole story so he slayed the you know with the javelin or the spear he he put the spear right through them and it stopped a plague and you know go and read that story it's a great story and he's also the son of Eliezer and the grandson of Aaron, the high priest. So you're right. He's the nephew of Moses and Miriam. You're right, Glennis. Well done. Okay, now we're going to do a little bit about Rahab. Now, there are Rahab mentioned in the Bible in, in, in a few different meanings to indicate, and you know, but we're talking about Rahab the harlot because Rahab can also mean insolence or um, a sea monster, for example. There's a poetic name for Rahab in Egypt, but we're talking about this Rahab. In Hebrew, it's Rachab, R-A-C-H-A-B. And her name means broad or spacious or large. According to author Hubert Lock Lockyer, the first part of Rahab is Ra, and it's the name of an Egyptian god. And as a Canaanite, Rahab belonged to an idolatrous people, and her name also had meaning of insolence and fierceness. Who knows where the Canaanites came from? It's a lot to remember, isn't there? Because we learn a lot in the Torah portion. But if you go to Genesis 6, it Canaan, says okay. the son of Ham. Oh, Ham. Where Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Okay, so Carol, I'm going to get you to read the, <laughs> the story in Joshua, verse. Uh, chapter 2, verses 2 to 7. 2 to what? 7. 7. The king of Jericho was told, Israelite men come here tonight, came here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you who have entered your house, for they came to spy out the whole land. Now the woman had taken the two men and had hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they, came, that, where they were from. The men went out when it was time to shut the gate at dark. I do not know where the men went. Chase after them quickly, for you can overtake them. Yet she had brought them up to the roof. She hid them in the stalks of flax that she had spread out on the roof. So the men chased after them on the road to the Jordan as far as the fords. They shut the gate as soon as the pursuers went out after them. Thank you, Carol. Now, what are your thoughts about this Rahab lying? Now, this is not just a lie. This is a treason against her king. So this is like death to her and she lied 
Now, we know in the ninth commandment that, you know, one of our mitzvahs or commandments is do not bear false witness, and that's like against anyone. So it's important that we do not lie. But what are your thoughts about this lie? I would say the Holy Spirit um, or an angel has come down and spoken to her and to do it. All right, that, that's, that could be one thing. Glennis, I won't discount that. Yes, Beth. I think she had heard word about the uh, the Hebrews, the Israelites. She'd heard how um, their God had helped them win many battles. And I, I think with all of the words that she had heard, she was prepared to really put her life on the line um, to be spared, first of all, I think that was her greatest hope, but she did put her life on the line. She did. And so we're going to get a little bit further. I thought that we're going to get to that, Beth, about what you've just spoken about. And so I'm glad that you preempted that because it's going to get our thoughts around this sort of thing, you know, when we're put in situations as well. I'm just hoping that the Holy Spirit's going to help us to understand this woman's plight and to understand, you know, the need for survival and, um, and, and protecting others. Now, whether it was by divine God had put this in this woman's mouth or not, we don't know. However, she has done this and there she's been rewarded for this. Didn't so, some one of the prophets uh, get hidden upstairs or something or somewhere and that and people they came looking for him? Was it King David's time? And they said he, he wasn't there and that <laughs> so they obviously lied too. Yes, that is true. That is a good example. And remember the midwives as well. They yeah, were told yeah, to kill yeah. the babies mm. and, and they didn't. And guess what? They were rewarded. God rewarded them with families. Mm. So there are I suppose an exception when. I think, um, sorry, I think I think parents. too that um, she she could see what was happening in Jericho as well, and I think that you know maybe she'd already made a choice that you know she wasn't going to be a part of all that. So even you know I I, I read somewhere that I know she's always labelled in the scripture even after she was with always you know Rahab the the prostitute or the harlot. But, you know, she, um, I can't remember where I was reading it, that um, they said that she possibly could have been um, an innkeeper of some sort as well. Yes, but I think that she just made up her mind and perhaps realised that, um, yeah, she wanted to be on the side of good. Okay. I'm really liking all of these conversations. So what I found in 1 Samuel 16, 7 is, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For well, the man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So my conclusion is that this is not, she is not being condemned for deception or treason against the king as her heart had the right intention, and that is to save their lives, the spies' lives. So I believe she's being commended for such an act of faith. Caught lying to her king, she would be killed. She had to act quick and in faith, and trust the God of Israel and trust these two men and trust this was enough to save her. Yeah, because after all, it was man's law, wasn't it? So yeah. she was yeah. disobeying. Yeah. Yvonne, are you able to read it all today? No? All right. Well, Carol, while you're there and Joshua there, can you read verses 8 to 11 for me? Yep. Before the spies went to sleep, Rahab went up to them on the roof. She said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, for dread from you has fallen upon us, and all the inhabit inhabitants of the land melt in terror before you. For we heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to, to uh, Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. Our hearts melted when we heard these things, and no man had any breath in him because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Wow. 
Now Rahab, like you bet said, Beth, Rahab knew about Israel's God and the miracles. She had the opportunity to change her life. She knew her people had no chance of survival. Her people were faint-hearted. They had no courage because of what they had heard. She knew that they would be annihilated. The city would be taken by force and she would perish if she did not act out. I think this is amazing that God would choose the one woman in the land of Canaan that had faith in him because God knows all things. This is just an amazing story. And she says to the spies, basically, fear not, I will not betray you and took them on the roof and covered the spies with flax that was laying out to dry. Now, Rahab knew that sooner or later the king of Jericho would be coming to her to ask about the spies, as this was a very well-known inn for the travellers. We'll get to the inn later. These two men seeking favours were men of God, not idolaters, and on the, on the one mission, and that was to overthrow the enemies of God's people, her people, and take the city of Jericho. Rahab brilliantly planned their protection and their escape. Not only that, she declared that the Lord your God is also God in heaven above and earth beneath. So Rahab's declaration is proof of her faith in God of the heaven and the earth in the God of Israel of the God in the God of the Israelites. Here is a Gentile woman who is a harlot who worships other gods. Yet she is saying, I want your God. I believe your God is the one true God. There must be some comments here, girls. What's your thoughts? Yes, Crystal. Crystal. I'm really thankful to get an understanding of this because it never equated to me how lying and righteousness could be combined. But I'm going to think that after this experience, not only did Rahab not prostitute herself again, but she would have never lied again either. Yes, I think your Holy Spirit is working you in working in you, Christelle, because that's where we're heading. <laughs> oh, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Is there any other comments at all? Yes, Bev. Also, I think uh, given the line of work that she was in, Quite often you see these, some of these women, they're quite forceful and I think with all of the stories that she had heard, uh, I, ca I can't say she would have enjoyed her work and I think she probably felt that there was a better life that she could have and maybe she was even like willing to give up the life that she was living unto death to attain something better. That's right. That's actually a very good point there, Beth. Really, really good. And I hope that we can remember what Beth just said there, giving up our life to attain something better. Don't yep. we see that in the salvation with Jesus Christ, that as well. But we'll get to that later. We, we're going to get there. So, okay, Joshua Two, twelve. Who hasn't read? Glennis, you haven't read today. Can you read verses 12 to 15? It's a long read today, but it's well worth it, girls. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you loving kindness, that you will also show loving kindness to my father's house and give me a true sign, and you will... Save alive my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours. If you do not tell, if you do not tell this our business and it will be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal in loving kindness and truth with you. Then she let them down through the window by a rope and her house was on the town wall and she lived on the wall. Is that it, 15? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Glenna, sorry, I was just reading. 
So knowing the two spies were in desperate straits, knowing her people were pursuing them, she did show kindness and decided to hide them and help them escape and then ask for protection in return for her and her family's life when they were coming back to take the city. So let me just read this. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us. Unless we enter the land, you have tried, tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head. If a hand is laid on them, but if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. The two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given us, given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. So the scarlet cord is deserving of a complete dissection to understand this fully. So I will give it to you in a nutshell, but we won't be going into that today because it, it is deserving of a full hour. But the scarlet call is the colour of blood, worked for Rahab, much as the blood of the Passover lamb had worked for the Exodus, that had every home marked with blood, was spared from death that night. And you can read that story of the Passover in Exodus 12, 13. Now, God's mercy and forgiveness of Rahab the harlot was signified by a scarlet cord, which becomes a symbol of the blood of Christ. In this case, it was the very token that showed the Israelites which household was Rahab's. It certainly was her hope of life. So I won't ask for any comments on that scarlet cord today because that's a whole teaching itself. So Rahab's house was built against the town wall with the roof, almost level with the ramparts and with the stairway. Yes, Beth? Okay. Sorry, okay. Yes, All I right. To go. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Beth. Bye. Bye, Beth. So the roof was almost level with the ramparts and with the stairway leading up to the flat roof, which, she could, have been, which could have been a continuation of the fortified wall. Scripture says she had a window and this is where the two spies were led down by the rope and where she hung the scarlet cord. Author Herbert Lockyer writes that the flax that she spread on her roof and the scarlet cord that she used as a sign for safety indicated that Rahab may have manufactured linen and dyed it. However, we're not fully known that. We'll get into some um, rabbinical literature soon. So that could be the case. So let's have a look at some pictures now, shall we? All right, where's my pictures? Okay, so here we are. This is where Joshua, the Israelites are at Shittim or Acacia Grove. Here's the Jordan River and here is Jericho. So as you can see, it's nearly 21 kilometres in distance. We've got Jerusalem down here. And here you can see all the mountain ranges, right? Just another little picture just of Shittim, the Jordan River, Jericho. This is an artist's impression of what Jericho would have looked like. So... The wall, when, the, when they walked around for six days and then on the seventh day walked around seven days and they blew the shofar and the ram's horn, you can read the rest of the story as to, you know, what God had instructed them to do. But when they did that and they gave a loud shout and the earthquake happened, the walls fell outwards. 
So that's where you can see the walls falling outwards. You can see the stone structure there. And so they all the Israelites would scramble up here. And so if you have a look at the houses built into the fortified wall, here's the wooden ramparts here. Here's the flat roof. And you can see the stairwells leading out. So this is a, an idea of what it would have looked like. And if you have a look in these walls here, you can see, let me just increase it for you. You can see these windows in the side of the wall there mm -hmm. and some here. So this is where Rahab, not this particular wall here, but where Rahab would have hung the scarlet cord and how the spies would have got out. I was just wondering how long it would have taken to walk around Jericho. And so I got this um, off um, a source and they were saying that the estimation of Jericho was about six to seven football fields long. And they don't believe that the Israelites would have walked so close to the wall so they wouldn't get shot by arrows. So they would have walked a little bit away from the wall, a 100 to 200 metres. So they estimated around 200 metres. We don't really know. So the, I don't know how, how you can shoot an arrow and how far you can shoot an arrow. But anyway, so the calculation is approximately 327 metres, close to two kilometres or 1.4 miles. And at the walking speed, they would have walked around. Don't forget, they would have had the arc and, and the marching of people. So the estimate and the little rest in between because they were walking around, um, you know, each day. So they rest, they say about an hour to get around the city. Now, that's not exact. We're just talking approximate here. So if you're walking around, you know, six hours and you're walking around seven times on the seventh day, so that's what they estimate. It may not be 100% accurate. It's just an estimation. My brain was thinking about that. How would they, how long would it take to walk around? So here's the um, excavation site of Jericho here. And these mountains are called Quarantania or Carantul or Jabal Carantul. So that's what they're called today. And so you can see the mountains here. And this is where they say that Jesus um, was in the wilderness and had his 40-day fast. Mm -hmm. And this is the mountain that they say that um, he was taken on. Not 100% sure, but this is just um, assumption here. Um, maybe Pastor Greg may know that and might teach us that in the Torah portion one time. So this is um, how the site looks today. Looks big, doesn't it? This is another picture of the site today and the mountain range. And this is how it looks today. I just want to put this picture in. You can see cable cars there, the red things. And this here is a Greek monastery. But I wanted to put this picture in because see the little the caves? Mm. So this is, uh, they're like honeycomb. And this is how the spies would have been able to go in and hide because there were that many honeycomb-like caves in these mountains that it was easy to hide. And so I, I really like being able to see that and being able to see the, the honeycomb mountains. Oh, you're back. Welcome. <laughs> so did you like those pictures? Oh, I love them. I love them. Yeah. So Rahab must have been an industrious woman of sorts. We've got to bring this home. We've got a few minutes. to. We've got 12 minutes, but we've got to get there in 10. So Rahab must have been an industrious woman of sorts. She had her own home and she lived separate from her parents and family. And Joshua 2, 622 says, go into the harlot's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has swore to you. So I find it interesting. Some Jewish and Christian writers believe that Rahab was a different woman from the one of who the Bible speaks of as a harlot. To them, it was abhorrent that such an immoral person would be included in our Lord's genealogy in Matthew 1 and also by Paul the Apostle as a woman of faith. And there are different opinions of her story. However, the facts show that Rahab was sinful, was a harlot, and yet, like Ruth the Moabite, Tamar and Bathsheba, she had a share in the royal line for which Jesus came. So let's just have a look at some Jewish rabbinical literature. I'm going to cull a little bit so we can get to the end of our um, teach here today. 
Now, Rahab, this is what it says in Jewish literature, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, in the Midrashes. Um, if you go to safaria.org, you'll be able to find all of this information. So Rahab was one of the four most beautiful women in the world, along with Sarah, Abigail and Esther. And to any man who knew her, as in knew her, and had met her in person, they say the mere mention of her name excited desire. So that's in Megala 15a. Jewish commentators, including Rashi, interpret the Hebrew term for harlot as one who sells food, bringing in your version here, Carol, basing their view on Targan Jonathan. So therefore, it has been suggested that the word harlot can be translated innkeeper, making Rahab the landlady of a wayside tavern. Sure. Guess it's been made that she had been a concubine, such as Hagar and Zilpah had been, but that in Jericho she had been a reputable woman identified with a reputable business. In the Talmudic literature, or Talmud, it is accepted that Rahab was a harlot and she was 10 years old when the Israelites came out of Egypt. And she pursued her immoral calling during the 40 years that the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness. There was not a prince nor a ruler that had not had relations with her, and she was therefore well informed of what was going on outside of Jericho. And at the conquest of the city of Jericho by the Israelites, Rahab became a sincere proselyte to the God of Israel. Then she married Joshua, and became the ancestress of eight priests who were prophets as well, Jeremiah among them, and the prophetess Holder. Now, remember, this is rabbinical. This is not what we know in Matthew 1 in the New Testament. That's in the Megala 14b. Um, I won't go to there. She was, she was Boaz's mother, wasn't she? Well, that's what it says in Matthew 1 genealogy. And when you look at it, if 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 Rahab was 10 years old, um, when you look at Samuel's um, family tree, which we'll go to if we get time, and Boaz's, the, the generation that did not come into the promised land, Salmon's father, Nashon, was of, Mo, of Moses' generation. So therefore, if he had his son, Salmon, Salmon would have been around 10 years old or a little bit older around the same time as Rahab. And so he was one of the ones that came into the promised land. These are through the investigations and the sources that I've been reading. So it, it's fitting to us that Salmon is, uh, you know, and Rahab, that, that, that they did marry and they are in the Lord's gene, genealogy. So when you look at it from that way, remember the rabbis don't have the New Testament as we do. Mm. So there's, there's such a, a lot. If you go to Safari, you can have a look at all the Midrash accounts. Um, one Midrash account says the merit of Rahab's deed saved the prophet um, Jeremiah from death. So when Jeremiah had been cast into the pit, Abed, Malak, the Ethiopian, was sent to bring him up. So there's a lot of different versions of Rahab marrying Joshua and different accounts of everything. But we have the version of Matthew 1 where it says, Nashon and Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse and Jesse begot David the king. So yeah, because... we believe that Rahab is the great grandmother of King David and is in the line of Jesus. Yeah, because it's not usual they put a woman's name in there. That's right. So it's significant. So, mm. yeah. And so, um, you know, the Hebrew term zuna and the Greek word porn have at no time meant anything else than harlot. So I just want to let you know that mm. that's what the Bible says, who yields herself indiscriminately to every man approaching her. So we do conclude that Rahab's house was an abode for travelling merchants and prostitution did take place at this inn. And remember at that time, prostitution was not regarded with the same horror at, in the land at that time. And we know our nation is a little bit like this nation at that time today. You know, we've got 
idol worshipping and we've got legal prostitution in some of the st nation, some of the states in Australia. So without, we can't go into that further, unfortunately, today because I need to bring this home. Can anyone think, so we're talking about Rahab, we're talking about her great faith and her action. Can anyone think, or actually, no, I'll do this. Faith needs action. <laughs> so in James 2, it says, what does it profit, my brother, and if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do, do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, it does, does not have works, is dead. So in other words, faith without works is dead. So this hmm. scripture is saying if we believe God, we show it not by our words but by our actions of obedience. We show God that we believe in him not just by our words but by our actions. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simply put, those who love me will show it by the actions of obedience to my commandments. So just looking at Rahab again and just summarising the teaching in the last four minutes that we have. The whole land was wicked with Noah. God was bringing judgment against humanity. Noah was a blameless man, showed that he believed God by building the ark. Through this, him and his family were saved. The whole land of Canaan was wicked and was about to be delivered into the Israelites' hands by God. Rahab was not blameless or righteous, she was a harlot. However, she is the only person in the land of Canaan that chose to acknowledge that God, the God of the people of Israel, and that he was the one true God. Rahab helped the spies and made them swear an oath to her. She had, the, she had heard of the great miracles of God, and she did, even though she did not hear from God directly, she took action to become part of God's family, therefore showing her faith towards God. So, you know, Rahab wasn't grafted in through the Abrahamic covenant or through the blood of Jesus, but through faith of her actions, she was justified by God and merited entry into the kingdom of heaven. So most of us here are on the Torah portion. We've got a couple of minutes here. Have been on the Torah portion. What have you learned in the last 12 months that you've gained knowledge and put into action, does anyone have a testimony of anything that they've gained? I can give you one of mine, and that is Shabbat. I never understood Shabbat, never really heard about it. I knew God rested on the seventh day, and that was that. But after learning on the Torah portion for 12 months and, and, and even longer, I understand that this is the day that God has appointed so I've learned the knowledge of it and now applying it. So that is what God wants to do. You know, a midrash for you to take away today. The Torah is near. The Jews replied to Moses, have you stated the Torah is neither in heaven nor is it beyond the sea? Where then is it? Moses replied, it is very close to you when you study it in your room. As long as while learning it with you, in your mouth or with your mouth, you prepare your hearts to do it. If you merely give lip service to learning, the Torah will not be close to you. And so to good day, girls, I really want to thank you. It's been an interesting look into Rahab and her faith and her action and Noah's faith and his action and believing God. And the same applies for us today. So I hope you've enjoyed sharing today and I hope that you can see how faith and action is important to us as women and hope that you can share something like that this week with anybody, anybody for our Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, Michelle will be with you, hosting you, and I do hope to see you then. We've got one minute. Has anyone got a testimony on learning something and put it into action? No one. I'm still trying to process it all. <laughs> it's the understanding. It's an, 
the hearing in it, but it's the understanding of it. I get a bit mixed up sometimes. Yeah, no, it, it is a journey of that's why we're on here. We're jo- we're journeying together. We journey on Saturday mornings. We journey on the Haftarah. And that's all we have today, girls. It is a journey, but keep moving forward and putting your faith in action. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye for now. Bye. God bless.